Today, I'd like to talk about a topic which is at the heart of Einstein's theory of general relativity, namely the topic of Einstein's field equation. These set of equations are not only important in the context of Einstein's formalism of gravity, but in all the theories of gravity. Let's get on with it. So, first, we'll be talking about deriving Einstein's field equations. Now, Einstein's field equations are akin to Newton's equations of motion in case of classical mechanics, or Schrodinger's equation in case of quantum dynamics. But none of those equations can be proven from a fundamental principle. They need to be experimentally verified, and that's their legitimacy. So like the rest of the physics, field equations can be determined and justified, but only through some logical steps. And those steps, the inspirations, have to come from the experiments and the observations that has holed up with all the verified results. So they cannot be proven, right, but they can only be postulated. And once they have been postulated, and we have got a consistent theory, it will predict results, and those results will have to match the experiments. Otherwise, these equations will not be correct. So the central idea, the central inspiration of Einstein's equation, the core of it, is the concept of conservation of the source. Now, whether you're a student of physics or not, you have probably heard this notion that mass controls gravity, right? There are countless explanations and pop videos that explains this concept of mass generating curvature and thereby bending space-time. But also in relativity, if you are accustomed to special relativistic concepts, for example, the equivalence of mass and energy, then you perhaps are also familiar to this idea that mass and energy in the context of relativity holds no fundamental difference. So therefore, the source of gravity, as we understand it, should be mass and energy, specifically the distribution of mass. And this distribution is a function of position and time. However, the more familiar concept to us will be the notion of density. And every time we'll be referring to this concept of density, we'll mean it to be mass and energy density. So let's talk about the nature of the source. The density of the source is, of course, observer-dependent. That means you choose a frame, right, you establish an inertial frame in your vicinity and you observe nature or a system in the nature. Now, the observation of one inertial observer will be different from the observation of another inertial observer, especially the observation of density because that depends on observer. And if you want to find out a mathematical expression for density, it looks like this. So an observer with a velocity u, which is a 4 velocity by the way, it's not a 3 velocity, this u has 4 components, and therefore the index alpha and beta runs from 0 to 3. So an observer with velocity u measures the mass energy density to be this special combination of u and this geometric object, which is t. And this t, as evident from this equation, is a second rank tensor. This t is a frame-independent object, which is a geometric object, and it is known to be the stress-energy-momentum tensor, which codifies the distribution of energy and momentum. Specifically, t does not depend on the observer, so t is considered to be the source. So therefore, it is quite evident that t has to be the actual source of gravity. So the energy-momentum tensor, or stress-energy-momentum tensor as it is called, uh, it can be chosen to be symmetric. Now, this point of choosing comes uh, specifically in field theory, but in general relativity, it is postulated to be a symmetric object. Moreover, it's not just any symmetric second-rank tensor. 
it also has this constraint that the divergence of this object is going to be zero. And this constraint enforces the law of conservation of momentum energy. Right. So this is what we understand by conserving the source. And it is at the heart of deducing Einstein's equations. So now we have a measure of the source. This time we need a measure of the gravity. So there will be a check and balance. The source generates the gravity. The gravity impacts the distribution of the source. And the quantity that defines the geometry of space-time will also have to be, like T, a symmetric and divergence-free tensor. So we shall call it the Einstein tensor G. The explicit form of G will be found out later in this video. So since it has to be symmetric and divergence-free, then the divergence of G is going to be zero. So those are the two criterions we can set or impose on G at the outset. The second thing is that since G characterizes the geometry of the space-time, so G will have to be built from the features that codifies the geometry and it must be built from nothing else. And the quantities that defines the geometry are the curvature tensor and the metric tensor, which we'll be seeing in a minute. So the generation of gravity is a relationship between the source and the geometry. Since the curvature is determined by the source, the greater the source is, the greater the curvature is, or the more impact it has on the geometry of space-time. So if matter is the source of gravity, then we must have this relationship where G, which is the Einstein tensor, is proportional to the stress-energy-momentum tensor T. And we denote the proportionality constant by the symbol kappa. The proportionality factor is to be evaluated by some other cases. Here, we'll be employing the Newtonian gravity, because it has to be the special case of Einstein's theory of relativity, or for that matter, any valid theory of gravity under some specific condition must dissolve into Newtonian's gravity, because we know for a fact that for weak gravitational sources, Newtonian gravity holds up very strongly. So therefore, all the theories of gravity at some point will have to be a general case of Newtonian's gravity. All right. So the conservation of source should now be seen as a consequence of Einstein's equation, not the other way around. Remember, we specified the conservation of source as the inspiration for Einstein's field equations. But now that we have the field equation, presumably apart from a proportionality factor, this equation is to be postulated as the truth. And the inspiration that we had, which is the automatic conservation of the source, is to be taken as a consequence of the field equation. Because now, axiomatically, the field equation is true. The automatic conservation of source, on the other hand, has to come from some fundamental principle, in this case, the field equations. And the vanishing of G will also have to follow the same reasoning, right? If T has to vanish as a result of the validity of the field equations, then the vanishing of the divergence of G will also have to follow the same reasoning. This is a little bit misleading. The G must not vanish identically, but the divergence of G has to. So physical or not, for any Riemannian system whatsoever, whether it's describing a real geometry or some imaginary geometry, the divergence-lessness will have to hold. So let us list the requirements for this Einstein's tensor. The first one is that, of course, G vanishes in the flat space-time. It's not the divergence of G, but G itself has to vanish for a flat space-time because a flat space-time is, by definition, not curved. Number two, D can only be constructed from geometry only, and as I explained earlier, 
the geometry is determined by the curvature tensor and the metric tensor and nothing else. And the candidates for G that we shall be considering will have to be linear in the curvature tensor, which is also called the Riemann curvature tensor. It will have to be symmetric and second rank, and it must have, as a consequence of the field equation, a vanishing divergence. So these are the requirements for G, and the only candidates we can consider for G will have to satisfy all of these demands simultaneously. So we start by taking the most general second rank tensor, which is symmetric and linear in Riemann, and can only be constructed from the Riemann tensor and the metric tensor, has this form. A times the Ricci tensor, which is a contraction of the Riemann tensor, plus B times the scalar curvature times the metric tensor, and a constant times the metric tensor. Here we have a typing mistake. The final G should have mu nu as its indices. This is a typo. I'd like to apologize for that, but this is the form. And of course, it goes beyond saying A, B, and lambda has to be constants. So we impose the divergence less now. So if you look at the previous point, the divergence lessness wasn't imposed, but now we require that this ansatz will have to have zero divergence. Now if you impose that immediately, what we get is that B and A are related by this relationship, B equal to negative half of A. Imposing the first condition, if you remember, is that the vanishing of G in the flat spacetime will also be a requirement. And if you impose that, then we have lambda equal to zero. So the answer now turns to a full-fledged definition where g mu nu, the Einstein tensor g mu nu, is equal to r mu nu minus half the scalar curvature times g mu nu, which is the metric tensor. So this is the familiar form of Einstein's tensor that everybody knows about, and it's also called the einstein cartan's moment of inertia. And the geometric significance of this tensor will be described in details in a future video. So now that we have our familiar form of the Einstein's tensor, let us now write down the field equation. So this is the current form of field equation. We are yet to find out the explicit form of the proportionately constant kappa. So in order to evaluate kappa, if you remember, I claim that we, we shall use the Newtonian geometry and therefore we are employing Newtonian coordinates. According to the Newtonian gravity and the Newtonian coordinates, we have the zero zero component of the Ricci tensor to be four pi times rho, which was the mass energy density. And that comes up straight from the Newtonian theory of gravity. So then let's just remember the trace of the Einstein's equation gives us that negative of r equal to kappa times the trace of t. So consequently, r0,0 zero zero has this form, half of the 0,0, zero component of the metric tensor times the scalar curvature, plus kappa times the 0,0, zero zero component of the stress energy momentum tensor. So if we break it down, right, step by step, these are the logical steps if you need justification, and this is what will be useful for us. We shall utilize this equation, but one small correction will also have to be introduced, is that for a Newtonian system, or nearly Newtonian system, the zero zero component of the stress energy momentum tensor is far greater and far bigger than the other components. So imposing that, we see the IJ components of stress energy tensor signifies pressure and zero zero components signifies the density and if you compare the relationship that signifies the velocity of sound which is far far smaller than one remember in relativity we consider the speed of light to be one and the velocity of sound has a far lower magnitude compared to the speed of light so therefore the latter terms which is the TIJ terms, 
can be ignored. So therefore we have R00 equal to kappa times T00, which is half kappa P, but also remember, we also got R00 equal to four pi rho. So R00 equal to half kappa rho, R00 equal to four pi rho. So therefore, kappa has to be eight pi. And this gives us the full form of Einstein's field equation, which is the Einstein's tensor G equal to eight pi times the stress energy momentum tensor. And that encapsulates all the Einstein's field equations. Within one equation, we have all the equations. Thank you very much for watching. The central concept of this Einstein tensor, which we have mentioned to be the automatic conservation of source, shall be discussed in the next video. Until then, thank you very much for watching. Bye.